16 um, women who I hugely respect and who I've worked with for a long time, who I know to be incredibly capable, um, have moments where they're not able to tap into that because of the physical or mental symptoms of what they're going through beyond their control. Um, and I just think the, 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 the sooner we as workplaces um, and as line managers and managers of all genders and, and ages accept that this is a part of life um, and this is what happens to women when they reach a certain age, um, until we do that, we're not going to be able to make those women feel more comfortable and regain their confidence and regain their abilities, which is obviously a huge benefit to the workplace. Um, but also kind of improve the relationships we have them, which can with them, which can only improve productivity and you know everything that we all want. So if we all work together in order to be more open, have a conversation, talk about it. Um, and provide information, education and support to um, both people going through it and their managers, um, then it can only be a good thing. Thank you, Gemma, and thanks for um, continuing so so smoothly. Um, <laughs> sorry, I was slightly really, shocked there. <laughs> really, really sorry about that, I really am. Okay. Um, so, um, Caroline, can we can we come to you a bit about? Um, it'd be really interesting to know a bit about what you see in Parliament and how how things are changing, and what also needs to change more, in your view. You need to unmute yourself. Fabulous! It did say that. Um, the, it just said the host is not allowing me to unmute myself. Um, look, I think what we've seen in Parliament over the course of the last two years or so is a growing recognition that we need to do more to support menopausal women in the workplace. The Select Committee launched our inquiry, um, and as I tell everybody now, it's, it's taken up pretty much 18 months of my life. So we launched it last July, so July 2021, and published our recommendations to government July this year and are expecting the government, well, I say expecting, so the government has 12 weeks to respond, uh, which means that it's pretty much in the next couple of weeks that we're expecting a response from the government. We made a range of recommendations around uh, making or a consultation on whether menopause should be a protected characteristic, changes to section 14 of the Equality Act, uh, so that you could bring a discrimination case on two grounds, so both age and uh, sex, and uh, a whole raft of other suggestions. And I always say, look, if you have to take your employer to a tribunal, that's actually a failure. Yeah. And although the headlines are focused around, oh, Noakes wants to make menopause a protected characteristic, actually what I really want to see is workplace menopause policies that are supporting women, that are keeping them in employment, that are introducing those flexibilities that we can know make a real difference and, and support women that way. And we've said that maybe uh, a big public sector employer, someone like the NHS could trial menopause workplace leave. But I think first and foremost, it comes down to, to what Gemma said right at the beginning is that she wants her staff to feel supported. She wants her staff to be able to talk about the menopause. We have to beat down the dreadful taboos and stigma. And it takes anyone, I think it particularly takes courage for uh, women in journalism, uh, particularly broadcast journalism, to confess that they're going through it. And I've just used a terrible word, haven't I? Confess, admit, mm. uh, to be prepared to talk about it. And I think it's really hard to acknowledge that uh, you're of a, an age where you might have reached uh, a certain maturity, experience, uh, a higher level in your career, and then you can be completely um, flummoxed by what's going on with you. And, and I think that's one of the big problems. And it's something it's why we've said that we should be teaching more about the menopause in PSHE at school, is that even those of us who think we're pretty savvy, who think that we understand our own bodies and that we're going to know and recognise menopause symptoms, I didn't recognise mine. And I like to think that, you know, I'm a sort of fairly aware woman, but it wasn't until I listened to a parliamentary colleague reeling off her symptoms in the chamber, I said, like, oh, I have all that. That's me. <laughs> uh, and then I had that sort of, oh, I can't have that. I'm only 49. That's outrageous. Um, and, and for me, that was a real eye opener. And I think it's brilliant that in Parliament we've had a succession. So World Menopause uh, Month last year, we had a debate. We had uh, Carolyn Harris's brilliant Pirate Members Bill and all of the work 
that so many women have done, uh, no, so many members have done, because we've had some brilliant male allies who I always mm. want to champion uh, around HRT shortages, around the need for a national formulary, around uh, charging for HRT and uh, the introduction of a single annual prescription, which is still too far off. Uh, and that's another recommendation that the committee has made is that the government just needs to crack on with it. I mean, how long can that take them? Yeah. Um, and so it's it's a whole range of progress that we've made in Parliament, um, but there's still a long way to go. And the Speaker has signed up the whole of Parliament to be a menopause friendly employer. That's great. The civil service is also signed up. Fabulous. But I still get civil servants sending me emails saying I work for the pension service. I work for the child maintenance service. I work for whichever part of government and I'm not being supported in the workplace by my employer, which is, by the way, HM government. Um, and so until such time as we have employers who are going to sign up, make those commitments and then have menopause friendly policies that actually work, that they do, they don't just do the brilliant training that's on offer, but they actually implement it. Um, yeah. And I don't think it's until such time as we, um, we have all employers signed up to be uh, menopause friendly, to be aware, to support their staff and, and not just sign up to it, but actually deliver on that, that I will um, find it time to hang up my boots. Hopefully that will be uh, in fairly short order, but I have a nasty feeling this will be a campaign that's still going till the end of my days. Do you see it as really one of the major things that you're battling on as um, as the, the head of the Equalities Committee? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And look, we um, I think it's, it's really interesting that it was a very it's a very consensual process to decide what we're going to uh, do inquiries on. This was a massive piece of work. And I don't know that any of us anticipated that it was going to take a year out of our lives. Mm. Uh, I've, I've taken some flack over it. I think um, one delightful individual told me that I was jumping on the menopause bandwagon and that the Equalities Committee should be doing more serious uh, Ooh, work. He, yeah. yeah, he got some fairly short shrift from me and some re-education, which he hadn't actually invited, but was delivered to him anyway. Um, yes. <laughs> and um, I think it, it sort of it came as a surprise to me that we were going to devote quite so much time to it the flip of that is that it's probably been one of the most rewarding, interesting, worthwhile things that I think I've done in Parliament. You know, in 12 years, I will point at this and go, you know what, we broke down some taboos. Hopefully the government will listen to some of our recommendations and act on them. We got uh, an HRT shortage, shortage, oh, I can't even speak, a shortage czar in place. Yeah. Uh, granted she's gone now and we've still got way too many of the um estrogen products under the short uh, serious shortage protocol still um yeah. but you know it feels like we're making progress and when i hear and see male colleagues on broadcast media talking about wearing the men vest absolutely demanding that they be part of this conversation because they've all got a female partner mum daughter, mm. colleague, employee, employer, that suddenly to me is saying we've made progress because, I don't know, five years ago, we'd have all gone, oh, not sure we want to talk about it. Well, Deborah would have spoken about it, but, you know, I'd have been right there on the list of, oh, not sure that one's for me. Um, and I've really enjoyed it and found it really interesting and worthwhile. And I think one of the best things, and I did a panel last week with, I mean, some great, great women, Dr. Nigat, um, mm was with us, Davina McCall, uh, Chloe Abbey from Five Times More, um, Riley Packer from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And the, the message that Davina was giving out, which is so important, is that it's brought women together. It's taught us that by working together, collaborating, uh, yes, yeah, sometimes, and I'm at the forefront of that, being bloody difficult and noisy and uh, kind of in the face of government ministers, you can make progress, you can make change, uh, and, and how important it is that we all big up each other's campaigns and big up the work everyone else is doing in this space, because, you know, we're 51% of the population and we need to be heard. 
Yeah, no, it's, well, thank you very much on behalf of um, everyone for all the work that you've done on this, um, Caroline. It's been, it really has been a massive sea change. And I like to think that it's also a part of a reappraisal of the lives of um, older women, that, that, that this, this kind of flowering of conversation around menopause is part of a reappraisal of what the later, later parts of women's lives can look like. Because I think that you're right that gendered ageism, of which the lack of conversation and treatment around menopause is a part, is actually one of the last kind of real kind of bastions that feminists need need to kind of fight. I really do. I think that the way that our society frames um, what women's lives are like and at what point they're valued is actually a really kind of massive taboo and the ageism and the gendered ageism in our culture is huge. So I think everything around menopause is, is brilliant and it's part of tackling that kind of larger, um, larger la that larger kind of... Um, way in which women are valued and judged, I think. Um, Tonya, I'm going to come on to you now. I'd be really interested to know from, from your perspective, what, what symptoms, particularly women at work, should be kind of aware of in terms of what, and what, what do you think is most often missed? Uh, uh, I mean, Caroline and Gemma have alluded to, yes, just yesterday in clinic, a lady said, I feel like the joy has been sucked out of me. I feel like instead of giving a sense of, you know, to work, I'm giving 110, um, you know, I, I'm not sleeping properly. I'm ratty the next day. Uh, oh. it, it's things that, they, they, the little things, but they all add up, don't they? And it goes on for a long time. People don't pick it up and, and people at work notice it and you think you're compensating for it. And, and you know nobody does anything about it. So you're not talking to people. People aren't talking to you about it. People are unsure how they should speak to you. Should they say anything? Shouldn't they say anything? And, and it just goes on and on. So I think it's, it's, it's really the start is, are you not feeling yourself? Which you know I, I hear very often, I just don't feel myself. I just don't mm. feel at the top of my game often these women are women really at the top of their careers and and they feel they're not giving their best they know the job inside out but they just can't focus they can't concentrate um and in addition so and, and that's the thing that seems to bother them the most these psychological symptoms that make them lose confidence so they put mm -hmm. up with the joint the uh, you know the sweats and the flushing and and, and they try their best to do what they can do at work, you know, and they go home and probably collapse at, at, at 8 p.m. Or, or 7 p.m. because they're just so totally knackered by everything. Um, mm. So I, it, it's these symptoms that creep up on you and, and it can go on for many years before you actually recognize, as Caroline said, oh my goodness, it's a menopause symptom or, or a perimenopause symptom. Um, if, if you don't feel yourself, you don't feel well, it's gone on for months and months and you're not quite sure, is it serious, is it not, you know, see someone about it really. I think that's so important to say because I think a lot of women still think, oh, it's, you know, it's hot flushes. If I'm not having hot flushes, then it's not that. Or, and there are so many different symptoms that people don't pick, pick up on it. Or what I've heard a lot in my noon community is women saying, well, I just thought it was part of getting old that I was more tired or that I forgot things. Or women are feeling like they've got kind of early onset dementia because they keep forgetting things. And all, I mean, all of, the, all, all of that, all of those kind of things. So, so, so if you're feeling not yourself, then that's a sign that you should probably do something about it. What women do is, is like I've just done, is we giggle about it. Oh, yes, it's, you know, it's my menopause brain or, you know, and, and, and then you get on. You, you, you try, you just try harder. You make lists, you do everything you can do to, to you know, compensate and to function at work. Um, but like I've said, yes, if you're not feeling quite right. And then, of course, there's the other things that women don't talk about, the vaginal dryness, the painful sex, yeah. all that on the joint pains. Um, again, if, if, if you, know, you start experiencing these symptoms and it's bothering you and you know, talk to somebody about it, there, there's, there is a lot of um, menopause support. Sometimes there isn't enough. Women sometimes say to me, they just want someone to listen to them and and this is where managers come in and can support support women um because if they feel unsupported at work it makes it even you know makes it 10 times worse 
No, I think that's so true. And I think we particularly used to see in the newsroom, which was such a kind of male dominated environment that any I mean, you could never mention any kind of a physical, a particularly not any kind of women's problems. I mean, we used to joke if we, you know, really wanted to, you know, need it or occasionally, if you would just kind of infer to your editor, your male editor, that maybe it was a kind of woman's problem. It was kind of, he'd be like, oh, God, just, you know, go away. So there was definitely a, a very kind of strong culture of not speaking about any of that kind of stuff. And I think that it's really important that that, that is that is challenge. Um, Deborah, do you want to talk to us a bit about the, the kind of training that you're seeing at work? Because from, from what Todd is saying, it also sounds to me incredibly important that managers are trained to recognise the symptoms. So rather than expecting a kind of, you know, a friend or a you know, colleague maybe to say, oh, you seem a bit forgetful. Is there a role for managers here in saying, you know, oh, you might, you know, are you are at kind of at, at this stage? Have you thought that maybe you're looking a bit tired or you're, you know, I saw you forget something in a meeting that maybe this might be going on? Do you, do you think that, that is that something you talk to people about? We, we do talk to line managers about that. And I have to say, line managers aren't born with menopause knowledge. We're talking about a context yes. <laughs> where across the whole of the UK, even yes. other women who are affected by it, very often come to our training sessions. We see this all the time. Tonya was just talking about symptoms. And when we see um, the slide on symptoms going up, um, even for those that are coming to it thinking, well, I don't think I'm there yet, but I'm curious enough to go along. And they see the physical symptoms and they see the psychological symptoms and you see the light bulb moment go on, particularly because we all recognize hot flushes, don't we? But actually what we hear from research or see from research, including the um, Women's and Equality Committee and going right back to the TUC, it's the psychological symptoms that women say affect them most. Yeah. They're the mysterious ones that come along and you know what, your periods haven't changed, so it can't be the menopause or you might not be having periods because you're on, um, uh, you're taking um, marina coil or, 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 something. or something like that. And then they see those symptoms go up and they go, well, I've got that and I've got that and I've got that and I'm getting treatment for that. And I didn't know that could be as a result of my menopause. So when we look, we're talking to line managers and colleagues and helping them understand some you know, you might call them basic facts around ages. Yep, 49, that's in there. Actually, it can be in your 30s as well. So keep mm -hmm. a look out for these. The stages of, of, of the transition and the symptoms, and just as importantly, what you can do, that's appropriate for everyone. Because mm -hmm. line managers can often feel very, very nervous about yes. talking to somebody about their menopause. And that's if they're proactively saying, actually, do you think you could be menopausal? I have had men, um, and it was a man in particular that said this in a line manager session that said, how do I tell a woman she's menopausal? Which you can imagine that conversation won't necessarily go where they were expecting it to. And no, so I, I, I got a sense just then of how difficult that might be, because as I was saying to you, oh, could you kind of say to a person they, they're menopausal? I can see that actually that could come across in, as incredibly rude, Absolutely. or you might even think you might be taken to a kind of industrial tribunal for kind of suggesting that that might be the cause of their behaviour. So I can see how line managers must have to tread quite carefully. They have to tread very carefully. So we do train them on, actually, this is a way of opening up the conversation. Think from a human being point of view. That might not get, get you the response you're looking for, but how are you today? Um, mm. You don't seem to be yourself. Is there something I can do to support? Just as you would do any other condition yeah. or, you know, somebody might look very, very tearful. It could be the menopause. It could be that they've had um, something happen at home. They could be. In, so you, you, you have to keep those conversations in a very um, sensitive, mm. supportive way. Um, but also line managers can feel very worried when they suddenly get somebody saying, because we've running lots more of these sessions, all of us are talking about it more, whether it's in Parliament or whether it's celebrities coming forward or us um, saying, this is, you know, I, I'm experiencing the menopause, what can you do? And line managers can feel very worried about that because they don't know the basic facts and they don't feel confident to talk about it and they don't know what support's available. So training up line managers is really key in the workplace to, to be able to support individuals. Um, because that's good for the line manager and it's also good for the colleague as well. So, yeah, yeah that's absolutely key. Um, I think uh, Caroline and I have often talked about, you know, me menopause policies, guidance documents are something we're seeing in lots and lots and lots of organisations. And the latest statistics I saw said around about three in 10 have got something in place. But actually a policy or a guidance document 
in itself going dusty in a filing cabinet is not going to change the culture and environment that Gemma described where somebody can feel comfortable in saying, I think I'm experiencing the menopause or I'm experiencing the menopause. These are my symptoms. This is what would be really helpful while I understand what I can do about this and, and, and ask for support in the right way. So it is the training, it is the awareness, it is the education and getting to a point where, do you know what? Menopause is not an unusual conversation in the workplace and we can talk about it without fear. No, I oh. think that's... In now, I think that's incredibly important. Gemma, I want to bring you back on the back on this. Um, so what kinds of um, I mean, within within the workplace, within reach, within the newspapers where you're in, you know, you're you're in charge or you have an influence on this. What kind of policies have you have you kind of brought in and what kinds of things seem to be being helpful? And also how many I mean, it's something that women in journalism we talk about a lot, but how many women actually in this phase are there within the newsroom because we know that senior women seem to vanish from um from from media newsrooms at about this point okay i think they're both really good questions to address the second one first um i would say that um there there definitely is a drop off of people of, of women of experienced women after a certain age um, whether that's to do with menopause, whether it's to do with kind of greater family commitments and those kinds of things, I don't know. But but certainly, uh, or, or gendered ageism within the industry. Let's not forget. Well, exactly, and let's not forget that. Um, <laughs> certainly, in terms of um, in terms of external um, external uh, recruitment, uh, mm. I would say definitely that is a, a big issue. Uh, perhaps less so in terms of internal promotion. Um, but yeah so i would say i i don't have um a huge number of senior uh women in my team who are of that age i do have some and they are ones who i rely on very heavily and who are real linchpins of the operation and mm. and for whom i have great respect I think that's what i was saying earlier on that i've known these women you know i've, I've been working on funding mirror for 10 years i've known them for a long time and i know i can i can identify the behaviors um that aren't them you know so all of us have spoken about um you know they did they, they don't feel themselves they're not acting themselves um so so yeah i don't think there are enough um women of the of that period of life um in the newsroom and not least actually because i'm a i'm a great believer um that across all across all platforms in order to really speak to your reader the newsroom needs to be representative of your reader, whether that's to do with age, race, you know, um, sexuality, gender, um, or whatever. And let's face it, a huge amount of um, the women that read our newspapers are either menopausal or postmenopausal. Mm. Um, and therefore, in order to speak to those women, we need to have a representative newsroom that has women who have gone through it in order to, you know, to be. Um, accessible um so i think that that's in response to your second question um in response to your first question in terms of what we have found useful um so there are certain things that have been put in place by the company by the hr team so there's a, a menopause uh toolkit which has kind of information educational resources that sort of thing which is directed not only at, at women going through menopause but also at managers um, but what I would say um, has possibly been even a greater resource has been um, our staff inclusion networks. So we, we have six inclusion networks across the company, uh, one of which is Reach Equality, um, which and, and there's kind of a subsection of that, which is called Meno Chat. And uh, we have kind of these sort of Zoom meetings there's also a g chat which is just kind of a casual chat on the email um platform um where people can and it's not just for women it's for for women it's for men who may be their partners going through menopause or a perimenopausal or it's for managers who feel that they have, might have um employees that are going through it so that they can just chat about it and just say you know i'm having a really shit day today actually i've you know been going through this or i really messed up a conference or i've done this i've done that um, and that kind of open conversation, I think there's only about like 50 or 60 people on it at the minute, um, but that open conversation and people just being able to know that they're not alone and know that it's something that is supported by the company. It's a, it's a platform that's supported by REACH and it's being encouraged for women to come forward and talk about their symptoms and talk about what they're going through. 
and I think that's really positive. What I would say is that um, I'm a strong believer that there needs to be some kind of mandatory manager training. And at the mm. moment, we haven't got to that point in reach. And it's something that um, I think we really need to push for so that every line manager has had some kind of training or education about the menopause. Because if you haven't been through it yourself or you haven't had a partner that's been through it, you know, we all know that we get taught about periods before we have our first period. But very few mums say, you know, certainly my mum's never sat me, sat me down and said, oh, do you know what? when you go through the menopause, this is what's going to happen to you. And it's really awful. And, and X, Y and Z will happen. I've educated myself. Um, and I think we have responsibility as a huge media organisation to educate our not just our women who are going to go through it, but the people that are going to be working with them when they go through it so that we can all understand exactly what people are going through and have a an adult conversation about how we improve things for everybody. No, I think that's really important. And I think also as media organisations, you have a responsibility on how you report or how you write about Absolutely. women at this point in a more kind of sympathetic way to make sure that we're not kind of reinforcing some of those kind of stereotypes which are out there in the culture. I think that's I think that's incredibly important. Um, Deborah, what what are the kind of what are the first things that you say to um, the managers that you're training? You know, what what you know if, if, if people are going to go away from this knowing kind of three things that they should be kind of looking for or doing or asking about, what would they be? Um, it, when, when you say the line managers, I'd probably take it a step back from that um, because, you know, the line managers and um, Gemma touched on mandatory training. A lot of organisations are doing training, mandatory training. A lot of organisations are also including it in their induction programmes as well. So there's a whole raft there. Um, mm. But the training on its own, I think, is not usually where organisations start um, because all organisations are very, very different in their approach. But we often suggest to them um, that they understand or that they demonstrate that it's important within their organisation. For some, it'll be a policy. For, for others, it might be a guidance document. For others, it might get might be senior leaders in the business saying, this is something I want us all to talk about. And it's fantastic when they share their story because that gives everybody permission to start talking about menopause and being more open about it. And actually the, one, one of the first organisations that did this, which was Seven Trent, that's five years ago, they started their campaign and they said, once they opened it up that way and their CEO and HR director and director of water and director of waste, they're a, waste, um, a, a utilities organisation, they were all on the front row. And that was them demonstrating if it's important enough for me to be here, everybody should be coming along to that. So that setting that scene, that importance, I think is, is so powerful uh, because it gives, it gives everybody um, permission to talk about it. The other is, and I would say, again, this comes back to where we are in the UK, not just in workplaces, um, but getting the conversation going, getting the engagement campaigns going. This isn't going to be something that cultural change happens because we all put out an email, because it's World Menopause Day. It is that constant drip feed of communications going. And it's great to hear Gemma's got the support group going in there because that's helpful to know we're not alone. But getting those conversations going, you know, it's World Menopause Day this year's theme is mood and cognition are we all recognizing that now we've seen so many employers that have got posters going out videos um stories that they're telling because that is very powerful so getting the comms going i've already mentioned training but i think one of the things that if i look across the organizations that have achieved menopause friendly accreditation what we're seeing that's consistent there is actually the listening and they're asking the colleagues two really powerful questions and one of those is what's getting in the way of you being at your best at work? Mm. You don't know until you ask that question. Um, and, you know, so we've had people, organisations coming forward saying we didn't know the uniforms were a problem before. Yet we heard a quote that said wearing this uniform when I'm having a hot flush is like wearing a boil in the bag. I can't cope with it. Yeah. Um, so asking that question, not just assuming because nobody's complained about it. It's not an issue. What mm. is getting in the way of you being at your best? And the other yeah. powerful question, what can we do to help? Yeah. And I think that then feeds into the, you know, you said we did communicate it again and rinse and repeat. Uh, and that really does start to open up the environment if it's both senior leaders 
and fabulous when you've got support groups. We saw one last week, which won support group of the year at the uh, Menopause Friendly Employer Awards. And they have lots and lots of sofa chats and invite people in. And But more than anything, they're just demonstrating they're there for each other. You know, if you're having one of those days and you just want to say to somebody, I'm not myself today, bear with me. You can do that feeling safe and comfortable in that environment. So the, I, I would say when we say menopause friendly, it's not just that we put all of the line managers through mandatory training or something like that. It's we've considered um, how we change it from being an awkward conversation to one that is, you know, an open workplace when it comes to the workforce. And they've even considered the facilities in that, whether that's uniforms, whether that's temperature control. Um, so, you know, when Huddersfield Town Football Club put sanitary products in all of their toilets and then made them available for fans. That was them saying, we know that there's a problem. We've heard that um, you know, flooding can be a problem. So here you go, this is something we can do. But that came very much back from feedback from colleagues in the business. Um, so you know, start with actually understanding your own organization and what will be genuinely helpful for people. Uh, so it's so interesting um, to really kind of get into the kind of nitty gritty of what people do. And I think that those questions are, are fantastic. You know, what's getting in the way of you being, you know, being at your best at work? I think that that's that's helpful on, you know, on, lo on lots of levels, isn't it? But really, really interesting and, and creating not just having a policy in the drawer, but really kind of creating a kind of a safe space around this. Um, Tonya, I'd be really interested to know kind of from from you, whether you think that within the medical profession, and attitudes to this are shifting. I mean, Dr. Nigat, who we, we mentioned earlier, was um, is is our noon doctor. She's a she's a, a very old friend of mine, and she always talks about how how you know how little the training um, it was for many doctors around when it came to menopause that, that, that they get kind of half a morning and some people didn't even do that do, do you think that that is is changing do you see more of an appetite to kind of learn about this and to be better informed amongst amongst doctors I mean I know you're a super specialist on this but but more generally is this something which is kind of higher up the list absolutely I I think there's still a long way to go but mm -hmm. I has been great change. So, you know, we're teaching medical students now about menopause, you know, people are learning it through their careers. More people know about it, um, especially in primary care, you know, more, more nurses, other other um, clinicians apart from doctors. So, so the awareness is increasing, the training is increasing, but we need to go further faster. That, yeah. That's Still are not enough people to to listen you know with the skill it, it, it is a skill I describe it as a skill to listen to the women and to arrive at a you know a point where they, they feel supported and you know they can get what they need and and do you think that there's I mean it, it seems incredible to to you know to me just as a civilian that doctors given that half the population go through this that doctors could be given only like a morning's training or kind of not even that I mean I was talking to Carolyn Harris about this the other day and she was saying it's going to be another kind of seven or ten years till actually the doctors who've been through the training really come into the profession I mean it, but I'd say are we seeing a shift on this where where the kind of health inequalities which dog women in midlife are kind of rising up the priority list. I mean, I know the NHS is under huge pressure at the moment from lots of areas. Yeah, and and it, it's more obvious with, with things like menopause because I suppose sometimes people see it as more a lifestyle issue rather than a health issue. Um, but, but yes, certainly the priority is increasing, I think. I mean, if you look at the NHS alone, you know, how many of the, the staff within the NHS are women of a certain age? So it is important. It's important, you know, for, for, for society. It's important for everybody. So we there is, you know, people are massively trying to, to increase the training. There's all sorts of training going on. For, yeah. for, um, but like I said, we, we do need more, um, certainly. And do, and do do you, have you seen a shift in the um the, the the intention to prescribe kind of HRT or doctors being kind of more kind of open to that? I mean, I remember the terrifying figures about one in four women who go who maybe needed HRT were being given antidepressants. Is that beginning to shift? 
it, it is it is it is shifting it is shifting certainly more women are, are getting um hrt uh and then the conversation is then shifting to what's the right hrt what's what's you know how do we tackle what's going on and it's of course not only about hrt it's about lifestyle changes how do we deal with that as well um you know it, it's it's about psychological well-being how do we talk about that so all these is, you know issues how do we talk about trauma um because that's again can impact on a woman's experience in the menopause and so there's there's still lots more to do but certainly i think more women are getting and it's it's being driven by the women actually and yeah. i think getting HRT when in the past perhaps they would have had an alternative. Now it doesn't mean the alternatives are not right, but it's it's finding the right thing for for the right woman. No, that that's really interesting. Um, you you mentioned earlier kind of vaginal dryness and um, painful sex. I've been trained well by Dr. Nigat to say vaginal dryness on as many occasions as possible. It's one of her real things, and Carolyn Harris too. So I think we should all you know make sure that we say that a lot. Um, but um, on on that subject, that's something that is a huge issue I see within my noon community. So my women are kind of forty five to sixty, and I hear so many sad stories about marriages which are you know in trouble because because women are finding sex kind of painful and really and, and real kind of you talk about trauma there's a kind of real I think there's a real unseen sadness there so just just if that's affecting anyone who's going to be watching this what are there kind of medical things that that women can do to stop that being so painful what what, what would you recommend I think that's one of the most important things that we can talk about here the women, a lot of women, I mean, probably not enough, but most women will attend for their smear tests to start off with before we even, you know, before they talk about, oh, sex is painful or, or the vagina is dry. And if that is particularly uncomfortable, it, it's, it, it should start ringing bells. Ask the question, is there something going on? Is, is there vaginal dryness? And yeah. then, of course, a relationship or, or sometimes it doesn't have to be. If, if you do feel that you are dry, but it's not just about that. We forget when we mention vaginal dryness that it also affects the bladder. And again, that's something we don't talk about. Urinary incontinence, you know, oh, where's the next loo? I can't go anywhere without thinking where, where the loo's are. And, yeah. uh, and all those issues where the treatment is so, so, so simple with some targeted vaginal estrogen, you know, some of those things can be treated very, very easily. Um, so again, it, it's something that just, just talk to talk to a clinician about talk to the nurse who's doing your smear you know make an appointment to see a doctor or, or or you know just talk because again the treatments are very very simple and you know it can easily take over someone's life and it's one of the things hot flushes and sweat may stop for some women those symptoms might last for for eight years on average but things like vaginal dryness will continue mm. you know in, in their 60s now, 70s, they, they probably thought they sailed through the menopause, but they're beginning to suffer with pelvic floor problems. And mm. there's, again, about that. No, I think that, I mean, it, it kind of, once one starts talking about all of this, it just opens up so many kind of, you know, more kind of avenues. And also I think it makes, it makes me feel so sad for all those women who've suffered there's so many, you know, so many generations of women before us who suffered in silence and not got the help that they needed and so much pain and suffering within families, which comes from this and in relationships because it hasn't been talked about. So I think that it's, inc it's an incredibly important um, conversation on so many different, different levels. Um, Caroline, just to come back to you, I mean, what what would you what would you like to see? What would you you've done been doing this amazing um, inquiry for the last eighteen months? We've heard some of the things that might come out of it. What would you see as a mark that that had really been a success? What would be um, you know what, you, you're saying that it's one of the most the most proud the things that you're most proud of of having been an MP? What would be the kind of cherry on the cake in terms of what would come out of your inquiry? Um. So we made a lot of recommendations to government uh, and we we have really only a week to wait before we start seeing the, the trickle in of uh, responses from the Department for Business, Energy and the Industrial Strategy, the Department for Health and Social Care, the Department of Work and Pensions. I want to see the government pick up some of those recommendations. I think the absolute cherry on the cake 
would be if they made menopause a protected characteristic. Look, yeah. I'm not, I'm not holding my breath for that. That's a really honest and candid answer. I think there'll be a lot of pushback around that. But for me, that has to be uh, a real goal. And I tell you what I found fascinating about the debate was that we had a lot of experts, lawyers, um, come and give evidence to the committee. We had some really full and frank discussions, both publicly and privately, about whether menopause should be a protected characteristic. And we had people pitch up who were opposed to it being a protected characteristic, who left the room supporting the idea. And that to me was a real uh, message that look, the system as it is, isn't, isn't working. We only saw 44 tribunals between 2017 and 2021 where menopause was listed as uh, a, a, one of the subjects in the tribunal uh, case. And that's not because women aren't being discriminated against because of their menopause. It's because they don't have the tools at their disposal to bring a tribunal case. And so I want us to see that change. But look, you know, it's very difficult to, to pick out which is my favorite recommendation. I think that's the big one. I think there's some yeah. really easy wins for the government. They could, uh, at the stroke of some delegated legislation, which doesn't take very long and isn't very difficult if you have the political will, uh, enact section 14 of the Equality Act, allowing uh, tribunal cases to be brought under two protected characteristics. We could see more training for GPs. I think that would be really helpful. We could see uh, PSHE, including menopause routinely. Um, I'd love to see a big workplace trial around menopause workplace leave, but I want an employment bill. Actually, that's probably the easiest one. We've had successive Queen's speeches, promise now it will be a King's speech next time, promising an employment bill. And I want to see flexible working. Uh, I think that's the, the thing that would make it easier for women to stay in the workplace. And that's what we all want, isn't it? We want women to be contributing to their own financial well-being, to contributing to the well-being of the economy. We want them to be independent. We want them to be able to carry on in work, take those promotions, uh, but be able to do so in a flexible manner. And I think the government could just bring forward an employment bill, do that, and, and send a really clear steer that they're on the side of the biggest growing, fastest growing demographic in the workplace, women over 50. Yeah, I, I, th I think that that's so right. I mean, there's some really interesting statistics around that. So, and the, the, ar around this and this whole new generation who's coming through. So in 2019, women over 40 start earning, start earning more money than women under 40 for the first time. And what, what we see is that is a whole kind of cohort of women who have worked all the way through whether they've had children or not, and are still there and are still going. And we are, you know, we're all pioneers in that way. There haven't been women like that before. And I think that's also why we're getting this conversation around the menopause and why also this conversation and these women are not going to go away. You know, I think that, that this will go on being a, a really important part of the kind of national discussion because it's a very different kind of mindset of the women who've worked all the way through and got to this point. They're more financially. Um, that they're more, more fin financially able and they're also used to having their voices heard and they're not you know it, it's just a shift in the way that women think about their rights I think that we're seeing reflected here um I <coughs> oh sorry um I'm I, I think this has been such a such an interesting conversation what one of the things that I was um somebody texted me um when they saw that we were doing this debate and they were saying because there's, there's some we, we're in danger I think of violently disagreeing and one of the things that I hear sometimes within my new community is is there a danger that by us all um, talking about menopause so much that women women get seen at this point through this kind of menopausal lens and can that be kind of used against us so a woman was saying to me the other day you know, well, in your kind of 30s and 40s, it's all about, are you having babies? And you just get beyond that. And now everybody's thinking that we're menopausal and we're kind of walking hot flushes. So I, I wonder, I'd be really interested to know what everybody thinks about that. And my personal view on that is that this is a really important conversation, but it needs to be seen through the lens of this needs to be fixed so that women can go on and live their best lives at this point. And I just wonder sometimes whether that gets lost in the menopause chat. What do you think about that, Caroline? Oh, I think there are some real challenges and dangers. Uh, and I did uh, a panel last night with Denise Wilson, who's making exactly this point that if we shout too much, then her mission to get more women on boards of FTSE 350 companies might be made more difficult. Um, I, I take a contrary view on that. I think we have to be, look, 
we've got to the point, um, and apologies if I generalise and speak on behalf of others, and I don't mean to do that, women are 50, uh, and I'll declare my interest. We're fed up with waiting. We're now impatient. Yeah. We're angry at what we see has happened to our mother's generation, and we're determined that the same is not going to happen to our daughter's generation. Yeah. And so it's about bringing about effective change now. I don't want change in five years' time. I want it now. Um, and I think it is important to keep talking about it. I think with all things that start off in life as a stigma and a taboo, whether it's talking about mental health, whether it's talking about the menopause, you have to keep airing it. And you can't, you can't go quiet, can you? And I think there are some really inspiring uh, women who have led the way, the Louise Minchins, the Davina McCalls of this world, the Penny Lancasters, who've been prepared to nail their colours to the mast, who've gone on the media and told everybody about what they've been through. And they've earned the respect of uh, a generation of men and women. And so we have to keep up the work. Um, and, you know, I will hang up my boots and think that it's job done when I feel confident that when my daughter gets to 45, she will not be discriminated in the workplace. She won't have to have a stupid conversation with HR about, oh, it's all a bit difficult it's about the change, uh, as I know damn well that my mother did. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I agree with you. I just think it's important that we kind of reflect some of the thinking that, that's out there. What do you think, Gemma? What do you what do you feel? What do you see within your organisation and pick up from your readers on this? I mean, I can only speak about, obviously, what I see in the newsroom and just, I guess, to bring it slightly back more to the journalism part of it. I absolutely do not think we're in any danger right now of over saturating um, the newsroom with information or talk or rhetoric about this whatsoever. It has not been spoken about enough. It needs mm. to be spoken about more. I don't think we're in danger of, of bashing people's ears about it because quite frankly, I know that a huge, uh, uh, for as much work that has been done, a huge number of um, my colleagues won't have even considered that the reason a woman of a certain age is acting in a certain way might possibly be because they're experiencing some of these um, symptoms. So I think that within uh, journalism, I think is probably behind slightly, um, or certainly kind of um, tabloid newsrooms, shall we say, uh, are behind. And therefore, I think we, yeah, I think we just throw everything at it at this stage. And the other thing I just wanted to say is that for anyone that is on this call now, or is going to watch this later um, and feels that they're not themselves or that they are less than they were or that they um, you know perhaps don't have the the urge to go on because they feel that they're suffering as a result of their symptoms now I would say the value of being a woman in their 50s for example who has experience in the newsroom is greater than it ever has been. We have a huge problem with talent acquisition. We have a huge problem with um, younger people coming into the business because of various things that I've harped on about before about you know the, the um, kind of lack of local papers and agencies that are usually the usual talent stream of young people coming into the business. Your, your value to the business is your length of service and your experience and your time and distance traveled and it's all of those things that also put you in this position now where you're going through something which is making you feel like you are worth less do not allow that to take away from the fact that you are worth so much more for that distance traveled as well and I think that's really, really important in terms of staff retention and talent retention um, for me as a manager and an editor and for people to feel as they're going through this. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really well said, Gemma. I think that um, maybe a few other media organisations need to take note on that front, because what we've really seen at Women in Journalism is a huge exodus um, from newspapers at around where women hit hit 50 um, and it's really good to hear that reach is really um, um, really reaching out to and celebrating and supporting their and appreciating their um, their queen age staff um, but I don't think that's necessarily the case across the media in fact I think the media is one of the places which has got the biggest um, problems around 
gendered ageism and and the media's lens on that is then extremely detriment, detrimental to the way that society thinks about older women as well so i think you know we definitely I mean, you and i are the ones on here who are the kind of media um have got the kind of media hats on so i think it's really important yeah. that we also admit some of the problems within our own industry Absolutely. i was in I was in an advertising agency last week, which is even worse. I was talking about about this and about the perceptions of older women, and they said that there wasn't a sit there. I don't think there was a single woman in that huge advertising agency who was over fifty, and there are certainly no creative directors who are women of that age, and and so therefore you have to really think about the messages that we put out into such society about what women are valued for. This is something I talked to a lot about a lot as the chair of women in journalism about we looked at the lens that was put on women by the media. And this is really, really part of that conversation, I think. But that's a that's another panel for another day. <laughs> um, I'm aware that it's seven o'clock and I'm on the strict um, orders from Kate to have a hard stop. So I would just really, really like to thank all of you for being amazing panelists. And I think it's been such a, a fascinating, rich discussion. And I'm really sorry about our um, our hacker earlier on, but I think we kind of have got beyond that. And thank you all for, for giving your time and for such a you know rich and interesting conversation. I've learned a lot. And I think every time we all talk about this, we all learn more. So thanks so much to Deborah Garlick. And if you want any training for your um, organization, then Hen Picked is the place to go. Thank you so much, Carolyn Notes, for everything you've done on this. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you, Tonya, for um, sharing such um, insight. And to you, Gemma, and to Women in Journalism for putting on the event. And I hope that we'll, we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>